Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I think we are live now. Welcome to our panel about redistricting. Uh, my name is Jessica Frankel. I'm the coalition coordinator of the Louisiana Coalition for Reproductive Freedom. We are a statewide alliance of organizations and individuals in Louisiana, and we work to ensure sexual and reproductive health rights and justice for all people through advocacy, law and policy change, and movement building. I'm so excited to facilitate today's panel. This is a part of an ongoing series we've been leading with the Women Project to bring together leaders from across the country discussing groundbreaking programs and policies, lessons learned in our work to advance positive change and of course share resources. And it's been a great opportunity, all of the panels for folks to hear from these amazing leaders from around the country who are doing similar work in different parts of the country and just be able to learn about each other's work and, and connect. So it's been a really exciting being a part of these panels. Um, as we're getting started in the conversation, I wanted to acknowledge that we are on stolen land. We do this work on land that was stolen from indigenous people, built in a country built by enslaved people. And we would like to encourage everyone to take a moment to visit native-land.ca. I think that's gonna be posted in the comments. This is a resource where you can look up which land you're on. And it's so important for us to make that acknowledgement. Where I am, I'm on Chittimacha, Choctaw, and Homa land in Bobanja, which is also known as New Orleans. Um, and when we're reckoning with all the violence upon indigenous people, with the recent conversations around genocide perpetrated at residential schools, we're continuing to reckon with racial injustice. We really have to do more than just the acknowledgement we're working to dismantle white supremacy and support indigenous led grassroots change and black led movements and campaigns. And it's also National Native American Heritage Month. So we wanna acknowledge the contributions of indigenous communities and work to right the wrongs inflicted upon them. We know we have a lot of work to do. So knowing that we are here to share insight and expertise to build a stronger community and push and movement and push for real and lasting change. So we want to kick off this conversation by making sure people understand how current attacks on voting rights are linked to ensuring that communities are respected and included in the policymaking process. Decisions made in state houses like each state's legislature and other halls of power, they do actually impact our day-to-day -day lives. It's not just the federal government that makes decisions, and it's really critical that we are heard and seen and respected. Um, we're going to be talking today about redistricting, and I wanted to just give a little gerrymandering and redistricting 101. If you're not somebody who is a policy wonk and you're not well versed in what that all means, gerrymandering, is, these are issues that affect our democracy when the power and have to do with the power of people's ability to choose their own elected representatives. So, gerrymandering is when districts are drawn in a way that favors one group or one party to concentrate voter blocks, consolidate party. Both of the major US parties have been very guilty of doing this throughout history. So it's not, we are not blaming one party because they're both totally guilty of it. Um, and we have ended up with some really crazy looking unfair voting districts. So I would like to encourage you, we're gonna have a link um, posted. It's govtrack.us slash congress slash members slash map so that you can look up your own congressional district and see what it actually looks like. Um, mine is Louisiana Congressional District 2 and it's like a long skinny weird looking thing that goes along the river and it's very clear that they're trying to isolate um, certain voters and not so that it can be concentrated so that this is one district that votes progressive where the rest of the state does not. Imagine if these districts were split up in a different way, there would be different power dynamics in each congressional district. So that's a common issue around the country. Um, and we have the opportunity for redistricting every 10 years based on census data, these districts can be redrawn and it can alter the balance of power in Congress and in the states. So each time they redo the map, it, take, it lasts for a decade. 
all of our speakers are experts on this and they could probably, they're going to do a fantastic job of explaining it to you much better than I could, but just wanted to make sure that um, everybody's starting from a place of knowing what redistricting is. So our first speaker is Ali Marcella from Represent Us. This is an organization that brings together conservatives, progressives, and everyone in between to pass powerful laws that end corruption and fix our broken political system. So Ali, um, could you talk to us about current attacks on voting rights and how it impacts individuals, families, and communities? Absolutely, thank you, Jessica. Um, we know that state legislatures around the country are passing laws and attempting to pass a lot more laws to make it harder to vote. So recently they've been targeting popular voting methods like vote by mail, drop boxes, early voting that were widely used and kept people safe while voting during the pandemic. And state legislatures far and wide in states like Texas, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona, and others have attempted voter list purges, uh, requiring some people to re-register to vote, new voter ID laws, restrictive absentee ballot requirements, and also fighting permanent absentee voter lists. And as for who this hurts, the short answer is everybody, but especially seniors, communities of color, people who have to work, caregivers, people with disabilities, and even rural voters are particularly hurt by this. So it's really anyone who might have restricted availability or disabilities that would be um, really hurt by this uh, more than the average person, even though everyone is hurt by it. But Politicians aren't reducing this access because it helps more people vote, but it's under the belief that the only way for them to win is by rigging voting rules to benefit themselves, which I know that we fundamentally disagree with. And just this past year, our team at Represent Us has spent a lot of time not only fighting back against these anti-voter laws, but also passing more expansive vote by mail laws in places like Vermont, and we also ran a campaign and passed a law to revamp and modernize local elections in Maine. So we are really proud of fighting back against those things. And beyond the specific voter suppression laws, I want to make sure we're tying it right back into redistricting. But we're also seeing voter suppression in the redistricting space through less constraints on racial gerrymandering. And I'm sure people here know that racial gerrymandering has a long and dark history in this country. But this is the first cycle in decades that we don't have a VRA pre-clearance requirement that mandates states or localities with a history of racial voting discrimination get federal approval, uh, either from the Justice Department or a court in DC for any sort of redistricting plan. Uh, this also applies to a variety of other election policy changes, but very notable in the redistricting space. And without the requirement, the process is left even more open to racial unfairness at the expense of communities of color and their representation. Now, Ali, you mentioned the VRA and the requirements and without going into too much detail, could you just explain briefly um, what the VRA requirements were in the past and how those were changed and VRA for those who don't know is the Voting Rights Act. Yeah, so in the past, a redistricting plan in a state that was identified as having a history of racial voting discrimination would have to submit their plans in advance to be approved uh, by the Justice Department or court in DC as not being a racial gerrymander. And that's no longer a requirement. And so it, you can still litigate that. It can still be checked, but it has to go through a different process. It's not checked in the beginning like it used to be. So how is redistricting linked to voting rights? Yeah, so when politicians craft maps so they win elections, this prohibits voters from having a real choice in who represents them in Congress, in the state legislature, on the local level. So these issues are fundamentally linked because without the ability to decide your own representation, your freedom to vote is constrained. Uh, freedom to vote includes the ability to elect representatives of your choice, which is often diluted by either racial or partisan gerrymandering. And to be very clear, racial and partisan gerrymandering are very much linked and often used in conjunction with one another. So they're not totally separate and they can be work, they can be used to enhance each other. Um, one way that politicians can actively harm the ability of voters to choose their own representation is through reducing competitiveness. So we know that 80% of US House elections are uncompetitive, which means 80% of people 
are put into a district drawn not to ensure choice or fairness, but to make sure a particular party or candidate maintains their majorities or can win elections in the future despite what voters want. And this is a very clear inhibitor of voting rights, though it's not the entire picture from a redistricting perspective. I, I want to be clear that it's possible to have some competitive districts in a gerrymandered state, but the overall balance of power in that state could be shifted so far towards one party or against communities of color that these voters at large essentially lose representation. And to give you an example, in a state with 50-50 Republican Democratic representation, an overall map that gives one party a strong majority or even a super majority would be heavily gerrymandered and hurts whichever voters are denied representation statewide, despite the competitiveness of an individual district, though that's obviously still an important factor to look at um, when analyzing how states and districts are gerrymandered. It's, you know, it's nearly impossible, if not totally impossible, to have competition in every district. But if you look at the districts statewide and the makeup on a statewide level, it can give you a better idea of how overall fairness and the effectiveness of your vote um, is impacted by how you're represented statewide. Uh, I think it's also important to point out that votes can be diluted by splitting communities as well, which erases or dilutes that community's representation and voice. And it's just another example of voter suppression through redistricting. And you know, essentially by being able to choose their own voters through this process, politicians protect themselves from having to be accountable to voters. And when they can't be defeated, they don't have an incentive to solve our problems. Thank you for all, all of that. Um, one challenge in pushing for reform is that not enough folks really understand the impact of redistricting on their day-to-day -day lives. Like I mentioned earlier, it can be kind of this like wonky conversation. So the Fair Representation and Redistricting Initiative has some great new research on how to talk about the process of drawing districts to determine representation in a way to get more people engaged. So we're thrilled to hear from Kathy Duval, um, who is going to talk with us. Kathy, can you tell us about your new findings on the kind of messaging we can use to get folks who are with us to enthusiastically, energetically, and relentlessly claim this process for our communities? Um, I definitely can. Um, so um, as Jessica said, I'm Kathy Duvall, I'm the managing consultant of the Fair Representation in Redistricting Initiative, which is a collaborative between funders and stakeholders across the country to really advocate for fair maps with a particular eye towards uh, historically underrepresented communities um, and with a real um, focus on the uh, racial equity um, and racial justice as we're looking at how communities are engaging in, in the redistricting process. I'm gonna share my screen to do um, just a few slides. See if I can do this seamlessly. Um, can folks see it? Oops, here we go. Um, so uh, the fair redistricting is super wonky, right? And Jessica started by actually talking about um, what it is, um, and to ex and she felt the need to explain it. And in fact, that is a lot of what we need to do. And so as we, as we started to think about how can we really help communities across the country figure out how to engage in redistricting, we thought doing some research would be helpful. So we did some research nationally that um, uh, to broadly engage people around specific um, uh, about what it would take for folks to engage in the process. Um, HIT Strategies worked with us on doing a deep dive into um, Southern Black communities to understand uh, the specific dy uh, dynamics in states like Louisiana. Um, the LRP like, research um, helped us look at uh, the big growing Asian American population, both in the South and the Midwest, to understand what are the particular um, challenges that those communities might have. Their, um, they're smaller communities, they're hugely split in a lot of the up among a whole bunch of districts. And so how do we help those communities to come together and advocate um, for maps that work for them? And then finally with BSP, we really dug in on um, looking at uh, Hispanics and Latinos uh, and what messaging works for both um, citizens as well as non-citizens as we think about representation. Um, the uh, in all of this, 
research, um, we are um, look that we uh, looked at talking both about representation, but it turns out that while yes, our voters are concerned about representation in voting, they're actually super motivated by the economic and racial justice and, and what it means. And so part of what we want is the message that we really want to say is don't be afraid to talk about race as we're doing this. And because as Ali mentioned with the loss of section five of the Voting Rights Act, we in fact have to sort of talk about our communities and, and the real sense of what the communities um, matter. But the biggest issue is that equity really comes from resources. And so people care about the fairness and resources aspect of it. When you think about resources, it's really about access to healthcare. It's access to, um, you know, to good schools, to good roads, to community centers, to health clinics. Um, and so those are the things that ultimately redistricting determines. And so connecting it back to those things that motivate people in addition to right voting and representation um, are helpful. In it. So um, this uh, is sort of a, uh, an example of one of the fair districts messages that we're doing and it's broken into three parts and you can start we lead with our values right the way our districts lines are drawn is crucial for our children and our communities futures. It only happens every 10 years. So I'm grounding that in values that we all share about our communities, our kids. Um, and also we're grounding it in this sort of legacy piece. Um, the second section talks about, um, about what the problem is, allowing politicians to, the, to draw their own districts, allows them to choose voters instead of the other way around. This makes it harder to hold them accountable, just like what Ali was talking about, and to have representatives who respect and share our goals and values. Um, and so the third one, and for um, and this one's really key, is uh, joining together our communities can be represented for the future of our children, good schools, good jobs for our communities. And we are um, we're not leading with you need to get involved to learn, you need to get involved to do in this. We're talking about joining together, doing this together, the community sense of that being important. Um, and so uh, those are the messaging um, sort of pieces. Um, I will, when I'm done presenting, drop into the chat. We have all these materials and messaging memos that are available for anyone to use. So we'll link you um, into to share any of that. Um, we're also then working with a bunch of folks to sort of lift up sort of these stories that are less heard, like when you hear about redistricting, it's often portrayed in the context of a political partisan horse race, like, well, the Democrats winning here or the Republicans winning there. Um, and they're forgetting, right, that that's not at all, people don't really care about those things. What they care about is, how is it helping my community? Or how it does it, is this something that I can, um, that's open um, and the process is fair. And so we're really lifting up a bunch of those stories and working with advocates across the country. And so that the messaging guide that I'll also share um, has a whole bunch of good links on some of that. Um, and so uh, just super quickly, um, and then uh, turn it back to you, uh, Jessica, is that the, um, right, it's so do connect the new maps to representation and resources. So don't stop there, go that further piece. Define your communities um, in plain terms that make sense to people, create urgency. This is only happens every 10 years. It's underscoring that lasting impact. Um, be positive about it. And then again, we're, we're doing this all together. We're not actually, you know, hoping that just one individual can do that. So we've made all of this research uh, publicly available. Let me stop share and um, we can, uh, and so you can access it um, on a website, redistrictinghub.com uh, forward slash resources where there's actually a whole bunch of training materials um, including in different languages. Uh, but then we've also put the um, research there and then a bunch of messaging guidance. And if you're looking for the messages, you'll need to scroll down just a teeny bit on that. So that's a little bit of the project that we've worked with and hope that it's helpful in terms of folks getting more folks engaged in the redistricting process. Thank you for sharing all of your research. It sounds like an amazing resource. Um, so I hope folks will check it out. Um, and I know that will be also shared, um, the link will be shared. So we know that political maps at the federal, state and local level 
fall woefully short of being either fair or equitable. That's what we've been hearing from y'all so far. And it's so important that we speak out and leverage our collective strength. BIPOC communities lack equal representation. And that lack of representation has immense ramifications for our politics, communities, economic, and society as a whole. So I'm gonna hear next from Peter Robbins Brown, who is one of my um, coalition members from Louisiana Progress, part of the Louisiana Coalition for Reproductive Freedom. Excited to hear from him today. Um, can you tell us from your perspective, what would it mean to have fair and equitable maps? Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Uh, and I think that a lot of some of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about has been covered a little bit, but get a chance to go in maybe a little bit more deeply or certainly from the perspective that we have uh, down here in Louisiana that I think also translates to a lot of other states. Um, so for years, you know, for those of us who've been watching redistricting, I think we did hear a lot of fair and equitable, maybe some other of these sort of big concepts that can be hard to kind of wrap your head around, especially for folks who aren't, you know, deep into this issue like many of us on this panel are. Um, and so at Louisiana Progress, what we really set out to do was to really define those and to help people advocate for them. And a big part of that is, is doing something that's measurable, right? You know, if you go in and you say to your state legislator, I want fair and equitable maps, they're going to say, what does that mean, right? Fair and equitable can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, depending on their perspective. Um, so we want to try to help people uh, give, get those sort of tools and, and some measurable principles uh, that they could then advocate for. Um, there's a lot of different things we can look at in redistricting, right? There's, you know, compactness and, you know, communities of interest and contiguity and all these different things. Um, but what we really centered on in terms of the ways to measure fair and equitable were uh, competitiveness and racial proportionality. Uh, we picked those for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, just on a sort of level of, of morality and politics and principles, uh, we think they're both incredibly important but they're also measurable, right? You can say, um, you know, this is the racial proportionality of our state, of our community. And so then these local or state maps should reflect that same uh, population percentage. Uh, competitiveness, we can look at voting patterns in the past to determine whether the current districts are competitive and then also project whether new districts will be competitive. Um, so those are, you know, we thought really important. If you're a citizen who wants to get involved in redistricting and become a redistricting advocate, we wanted you to be able to go in and say, this is what I mean by fair and equitable. This is how I measure it. This is how I know the maps as they currently are or aren't fair and equitable and the maps that you're that we're looking at are or aren't fair and equitable. Um, so, you know, I, we've already kind of heard about why racial, these, these are important principles in and of themselves, but I do want to just kind of cover it again, you know, uh, uh, on the competitiveness front, I think it's clear, and I don't think anybody would really disagree with this, that, that we live in very divisive times, socially and politically. Uh, it, it's not the fault of redistricting that we live in these very divisive times, but uh, having very safe maps, these non-competitive maps, it fuels that division, right? It incentivizes elected officials to tack to their political extremes because they're not worried about a challenge from another party. They're only worried about being challenged, if challenged at all, uh, from the sort of extremes of their own party. Uh, the other part is that, you know, a lot of times we don't even see any challenges, right? Uh, in Louisiana, we have 144 state legislative districts between the House and the Senate. In our last uh, statewide election cycle, 52 of those were uncontested. So well over a third, just nobody ran against, you know, the incumbent or somebody who was sort of handpicked by one of the political parties to run. And so when we talk about uh, voter suppression, um, which, uh, you know, which Ali got into at the beginning, um, a big part of, you know, we think about, oh, uh, you know, vote by mail or Dropbox or some of these issues that came up, uh, you know, especially in the midst of the pandemic last year during the, the presidential election cycle. But to me, the, the most insidious form of, of voter suppression is just people not having a choice or and or not feeling like they have a choice. And when you do that, and that happens to them sort of cycle after cycle, whether it's at the local, state, or federal level, people just become disengaged because they think their vote doesn't matter. And the unfortunate reality is that when we draw these non-competitive maps, that's actually kind of true. And so when, you know, as I'm a community organizer along with sort of an, you know, an advocate and when I go and try and talk to people about getting involved in the political process and they say, you know, why should I turn out to vote? I mean, I care about these things, but my vote doesn't translate to change or these elected officials don't care. I want to be able to say to them, oh, no, it's, it, it does, you know, and I do 
say that to them, but you know, there is kind of a caveat that there are these situations where it, it kind of doesn't. And when we talk about trying to build movements for change to fix, you know, some systemic issues that, that are, you know, really plaguing our society, this lack of competitiveness, which then breeds apathy is a big part of why we're having a hard time. We just had um, an election here in Louisiana last week. Uh, really the only um, local stuff that was on the ballot was in New Orleans. That was sort of important municipal election, but there were these four constitutional amendments that everybody in the state could have voted on. We had 14% voter turnout. Um, you know, that's, that's a, now part of this, we have way too many elections and that's kind of a Louisiana specific ish, ish, issue. But, um, you know, again, when you, when people just don't feel like their voice and their vote matters, this is what you kind of start to see. And then we open up a whole other sort of Pandora's box of, of issues that I think we're seeing happen here, happen nationally. Um, on the racial proportionality front, you know, especially in Louisiana, but I think this is very true of, you know, every other state. Um, but, you know, we have about as horrific a history of racial oppression uh, at all levels of society, economic, political, social, uh, of anywhere you're going to find. Um, and, and, you know, through the political process, one of the most uh, powerful and effective tools of that racial oppression is through redistricting. Um, you know, when we talk about racial proportionality, the most obvious example we have here in Louisiana is that we have about a third of our state is black. We have the second highest proportion of black residents of any state next to Mississippi. Um, and so about a, with about a third of the population being black and we have six congressional districts, well, it just seems clear two of those congressional districts should be majority minority, um, but only one is. And the other five are actually very much gerrymandered to be uh, very strongly white conservative uh, voting blocks. Uh, to the point where in none of those districts do black residents really get to choose a candidate or vote for a candidate of their choice. Um, so when we talk about trying to unwind, I think some of, you know, undo or fix or, you know, create a better future, uh, specifically speaking to some of those issues that uh, Jessica opened up by talking about, um, redistricting can be a really powerful tool if it's done right. It can also be a really powerful tool in the opposite direction. Um, and, you know, ultimately we talk about, uh, when we get upset about something, we're gonna vote them out, we're gonna hold them accountable. Um, we, you know, redistricting, you know, and creating some competitive districts. And, you know, again, to Ali's point, we, we can't make every district competitive. Um, you know, again, in a state like Louisiana, we do have a very large, um, you know, population of folks who would, you know, fall into one political, you know, side or the other. And there's just gonna be some districts that reflect that. but. Creating more competitive districts uh, is, is, I think, really the key. And, and then ultimately not forgetting about the local level. Um, you know, again, you know, I, I always try to think about this in, in, as an organization, we think about this as this is a long-term movement that we're trying to build to, to fix these systemic issues. And a lot of that, you know, it filters up actually. You know, I think sometimes we think of it, you know, we see the news or whatever, and you know, we think of it as kind of coming down from on high, but to get to that point, we really have to build up from the ground. And, and that means looking at your, uh, what we call them parishes here in Louisiana, everybody else calls them counties, you know, your county board of supervisors, your city council, your school, local school board. Um, do those districts reflect your community? Because when we talk about building power and getting folks into positions who will actually represent us, that starts at the hyper local level. And so let's not forget about that. And, and in fact, I think that's where most citizen advocates can have the biggest impact. Thank you for really fleshing out what I was trying to explain so beautifully. Um, something I just wanna add is I've worked in um, this arena in Georgia and in Louisiana and just every state is so different y'all. Like the, the laws of each state, the, I mean, Louisiana is a special state, let me tell you, because we have Napoleonic code and we have a lot of our own rules. Peter mentioned that we have a lot of elections. It doesn't work that way in every, in other states, it's different from state to state, but um, this is why these issues are so important. So can you talk a little more about the Fair Maps Louisiana campaign that y'all are working on? Yeah, um, there's there's a great coalition of organizations. I kind of jokingly would call it the uh, coalition of acronyms. You know, it's a lot of NAACP, ACLU, uh, Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center. So. Um, some, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of folks. Um, 
who are, you know, coming together to, uh, you know, really advocate, I think, you know, starting with that sort of creating the second um, majority minority congressional seat, but certainly looking all the way down the line. Um, and, and, you know, each organization is kind of doing its own thing, you know, but also then coming together around some of these bigger, like, shared principles. So that second majority minority congressional district, um, more majority minority legislative districts, just like I talked about um, how our congressional district is racially disproportionate. Uh, same thing is true of our legislature. So again, about a third of our state's residents are black, only about 26% of our state legislative seats are majority minority. Um, and that's kind of true, I mean, local level, and then some of these other statewide bodies. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a lot of different folks coming together who can bring different, um, you know, skills and experience. We've got, you know, a bunch of uh, lawyers who can really bring that to bear on the process, especially trying to create some leverage on the front end to hopefully not actually end up in court. Um, we've got a lot of organizers who are trying to uh, get folks in community um, interested. So turn out like the legislature, uh, one fortunate thing here is that our legislature is actually running a very transparent process. I know that isn't the case in every state. Um, and they are doing this road show that they have traditionally done every decade. And so um, a lot of us are coming together to try to drive turnout to these um, regional road show hearings, uh, which has been really successful so far. And I think a big piece of this, and this is one that I, I should have touched on earlier, is um, really trying to shape the narrative. I mean, when we talk about what can we do to impact this, um, you know, when we're talking about, you know, and I, and I think that, you know, Kathy, you know, obviously laid that out, is getting out front of this and, and you know, talking about values, saying that, yeah, you know, we don't necessarily care whether it's Democrats or Republicans or, you know, any kind of party. What we're saying is that we want, you know, to have a choice. We want our vote to matter. We want our voice to matter. And so really trying to shape that narrative through, you um, op-eds, radio appearances, uh, you know, I do way too many interviews. I, I kind of don't like it, but it's just, it's, it's one of the most powerful tools we have because, you know, the other side to this is really just a power grab, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's what, you know, and so when we get out there and we talk about our values and we do it, you know, maybe, like I said, too much, but, you know, okay, um, is it, it, then it kind of puts that the folks who don't want competitive maps and the folks who don't want racially proportional maps or you know some of these other values that we talk about it puts them in a position where they have to explain why they don't want that and i don't think they want to have to explain that um they want this to happen behind closed doors and they don't want anybody asking questions and so the more we can get out there uh you know everywhere on facebook live on you know your local radio station you know, maybe a little newspaper in your, you know, in your town that only has a few hundred people circulation, like that's, you can reach a few people by putting an op-ed in there. So getting out there and, and shaping that narrative is a really important tool in this. Thank you. So as you mentioned, as everyone's mentioned, it shouldn't be about partisan politics. It should really be about representation and um, allowing voters to elect people who represent them and that will serve their, their needs. Representative maps are fundamental to ensure that every vote counts and serve as a foundation of systemic equality for black and brown residents. So we're thrilled to hear next from John Marion from Common Cause Rhode Island. This is another great nonpartisan organization that promotes representative democracy by ensuring open, ethical, accountable, effective government processes at local, state, and national levels by educating and mobilizing the citizens of Rhode Island. John, can you tell us more about the Redraw Rhode Island and, uh, sorry, Redraw Rhode Island and your efforts to push for an independent redistricting commission? Sure, um, and thank you for, for having me to the, to the Women Project. Um, yeah, so I'm up in Rhode Island, uh, and, but I'm part of a national organization. So um, our work, um, while we don't all work on the same thing across the country, one common theme of our work uh, in all our states is on redistricting reform. And you've heard of, from a few people starting with Ali and other people um, have hit on it. You know, the, the fundamental problem um, with how redistricting is done in the United States, which is very different than how it's done uh, in most democracies, is that the, the politicians are drawing their own districts. In most countries, uh, they're drawn by uh, someone else, uh, oftentimes uh, bureaucrats, um, but not always. 
And so there's a fundamental conflict of interest. I also work on ethics law and, and you know, that would be considered a conflict of interest because they have a material benefit um, from the, the decisions they get to make. So, you know, common causes preferred policy solution is to take it out of their hands and the, they being the politicians who, who stand to benefit. Uh, and so we have long supported uh, creating independent redistricting commissions. Common Cause California um, uh, pioneered this uh, in the 2010 cycle with the California Redistricting Commission, which uh, was very successful uh, by, by many measures in creating better maps uh, for, for California and engaging more people in the process. Um, the, the one statistic that has always just blown me away uh, is in the 2010 cycle, 27,000 people applied to be on the commission. Like not 27,000 comments from the public, 27,000 people stepped forward to say, I want to be a part of this process. That even given the scale of California, that's, that's remarkable um, how many people were interested enough in uh, uh, affecting the outcome that they were willing to basically take what amounted to a full-time job um, uh, to do that. So uh, Common Cause has pushed this in a number of states, these independent commissions, um, mostly in states with um, ballot initiative uh, where voters can using um, uh, petitions, get constitutional amendments on the ballot. Unfortunately, Rhode Island doesn't have that option. Um, the only way to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot is through the legislature. So we uh, developed a campaign two years ago uh, that we called Redraw Rhode Island. Um, the website is redrawri.org. Uh, and we proposed a ballot initiative um, for referral by the legislature that would take um, redrawing the maps uh, every 10 years away from our General Assembly, what we call our state legislature, and give it to an independent commission. It was scaled down from that California model, right? You know, we're 1 million people, there are more than 30 million people. Uh, we're not going to have 27,000 people apply for our commission. Um, so we don't need the sort of infrastructure uh, that, that California had. Uh, so this isn't a one size fit all reform. Um, you know, there are many cities uh, and counties that have adopted independent commissions uh, in California and elsewhere. Um, in fact, the city of, of Providence, Rhode Island, our capital city, has uh, a sort of version of, of redistricting reform uh, that, that we did in 2012. So, you know, our uh, method is, again, taking it out of the, the politicians' hands. We weren't successful um, in, in that effort. We'll renew it after this redistricting cycle um, is over. Uh, but right now, we're, we're focused on organizing people um, to uh, do what we refer to as community mapping. So Common Cause uh, nationally is part of a coalition called the Charge Coalition. Uh, and the Charge Coalition is leading something called Redistricting Community College, where they're teaching people to draw their own communities uh, and then show up at these redistricting hearings with maps of their communities. So you can um, just Google the Charge Coalition or Redistricting Community College uh, and find some of those trainings. Uh, and, and our goal here is just to engage people in the process, right? This can seem pretty esoteric. Um, 10 years ago, we were asking people to draw, you know, whole sets of maps, um, you know, 75 house maps in Rhode Island. Nobody's going to take the time to draw 75 house maps, um, but they are going to draw their community, right? And so um, we are using um, free tools like districtr.org or Representable or Dave's Redistricting app, and just encouraging people to draw their neighborhood, right? Um, what, what does your neighborhood look like? Why does it deserve uh, representation? Uh, and then we're encouraging them and training them to go to redistricting commissions and say, listen, here's my, my community, please don't divide it in half. Um, you know, and, and these are the reasons why. Uh, and it's been working, um, not, not as much in Rhode Island, but in other states, um, we are seeing people turn out at these hearings, uh, you, empowered by these new tools, that weren't available um, in prior cycles and, and really sort of represent their communities. Wow. Well, we know that this work takes years and years and decades. So 
I know it's a long, it's all a long haul to see real, to be able to really move the needle. So you mentioned some of the um, programs, but is there anything else about uh, any other ways folks could get involved in local efforts like the ones you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I think um, th there's a couple um, points. One is we've largely been talking about uh, redrawing congressional maps um, or state legislative maps. There are boundaries being drawn uh, for school boards. There are boundaries being drawn for city councils. There are boundaries being drawn for all sorts of special um, bodies out there. And oftentimes that, that comes after uh, the state legislature is done and it's being done at a local level. That is a great place to engage, right? There is a kind of a long tail to the redistricting process that we don't talk about enough. We focus on the balance of power in the U.S. House of Representatives, which is incredibly important, but it may be important to your community about where your school board lines are drawn. That may be what is entrenching, you know, segregation uh, in, in your school district. And so you can get involved there. In fact, you can probably be more powerful there because fewer people are paying attention. Uh, so find out who is drawing the lines at the local level uh, and turn out for those, those meetings. So here in Rhode Island, um, you know, our capital city uh, has a little um, five person um, ward, they call it ward reboundering, ward redistricting commission. Uh, and, and we're going to turn people out for those hearings um, because there are questions of environmental justice uh, and discrimination that, that are a result of historically drawn uh, city council lines um, uh, in, involving uh, the Port of Providence. And, and you know, those can be remedied through the redistricting process, but only if people get involved uh, at the local level. And these same tools that can be used to draw communities to affect uh, state legislative and congressional district lines are, are in some ways even more powerful at the local level. It's, it's more important that neighborhoods not to be, be divided when it comes to who represents them on the city, the city council. So thank you for sharing all of your work. Um, tremendous work is being done through grassroots organizing and engaging the process as it exists, but the process itself needs to change. So Lauren Beeler from State Innovation Exchange is here to talk to us about legislative efforts to reform redistricting. State Innovation Exchange, or SIX for short, gives legislators the tools and building blocks they need to move bold progressive public policy. Lauren, can you tell us about a few of the recent victories in state legislatures to improve the redistricting process and help ensure that states have fair maps? Absolutely. So thank you so much, um, Jessica, first and foremost, for um, the lovely introduction, also for having me on today's panel for really this important dialogue um, at a very contentious time um, as we're diving into redistricting. Um, as mentioned, State Innovation Exchange, or six. Um, is a national resource and strategy center um, that works with legislators to amplify their voices around progressive and equitable policy um, and provide them with the resources, tools um, to be able to do so. So, so happy to be here um, as uh, the democracy director for six. So the first thing I wanna dive into here um, because typically redistricting and victories are not necessarily in the same sense. Um, so the first thing I wanna dive into is how we're defining victories. With redistricting, every little effort could technically be defined as a victory. Um, redistricting has been at the forefront of many states following the release of the 2020 census data and state legislatures in at least 35 states um, are expected or have been expected to approve post census revamped congressional and state legislative districts during their 2022 sessions in order for them to be in effect for um, next year's November elections. Although that there are intense, and I do emphasize intense fights ahead in states like Alabama, Michigan, and Texas, to name a few, with racial and partisan gerrymandering lawsuits already in process. Um, states like Maine, for instance, emerged with less controversy in 2021. Um, in September of this year, the Maine legislature approved new congressional legislative and as it's been mentioned, mentioned uh, for the local level, county commission maps without the heavily contentious bipartisan fights 
and gerrymandering that plagued efforts in other states. The maps were approved by a two thirds majority in both chambers and the governor, Governor Mills, wasted no time in providing her signature, making Maine the second state after Oregon to complete the redistricting process. Now, Oregon, two days prior to Maine, um, the Oregon Democrats passed plans for new congressional and legislative districts on mostly party line votes. And also in September, Colorado, Colorado's Independent Redistricting Commission, and it's important to note the type of commission, um, agreed on a congressional map and went to the Colorado Supreme Court for approval. So one thing I want to highlight here, um, one, these are different types of commissions, uh, but all still getting it done early. Another thing to note is a pattern here. Um, with these states, uh, the pattern to notice is that the redistricting processes that avoided conflict or gerrymandering drama um, tended to take place earlier this year. Now, that's something that, again, when we're looking at the legislative landscape and we're preparing for fights ahead and we're being proactive rather than reactive, we need to note how that's taking place. As it was mentioned earlier through Ali, um, this is clearly tied to voter suppression efforts. So we're looking at probably January or February of next year where they will go, the legislatures across many states will go straight into redistricting and will pick up many of them who plan to pick up voter suppression bills that um, either were in a contentious fight um, this year or um, maybe didn't pass what they plan, plan to bring back um, will, will be picked up around that time frame, um, which by the way, in some states will still be dealing with uh, budget fights at that same time, in addition to redistricting. Now, this is all happening before primaries. So um, putting my C4 hat on quickly and taking off my C3 hat. Um, again, we need to look at how all of these things coincide. Many of the attacks that took place this year, um, one, were intersectional, and two, aligned with one another. So again, we just kind of want to define that because technically, some of these are small wins or small victories, but there are larger fights ahead um, that uh, really will develop the redistricting landscape moving forward. Um, so a couple of things I just want to note um, as we prepare and look at some more victories. Um, the states that have at least adopted redistricting forms in the past decade have the potential to have redistricting efforts challenged by a single party to be more inclusive or have an independent nonpartisan redistricting commission will include Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Virginia, Utah, Colorado, and Louisiana. Now, granted, Republicans are tying, tying these redistrict, redistricting to voting rights attacks legislation. Many of the states that I just listed um, will have an uphill battle, but will let, be likely to be less contentious, meaning they will at least have a veto um, by the governor, or um, there could be a potential um, ballot initiative, or they could, if, for states, especially like Michigan, who has at least attorney general and the Michigan Supreme Court, um, it will again help to make these fights less contentious. So again, small win, small victory. Um, and then some states that people should just be on alert about um, are Washington, California, Arizona, and Illinois. The reason to mention those states are following census results. Each of these states saw significant non-white population growth in certain regions in the last decade and could see fights um, over increased representation demands for growing communities of color, which would lead us into the conversation about communities of interest. Thank you. So wanted to ask about how are these efforts particularly important for folks who are often pushed to the margins? Yes, so uh, let's, let's just take it back a little bit and lay some foundation here. Um, in June of 2019, the US Supreme Court ruled that partisan gerrymandering is a political question because no fair test exists for courts to determine when partisan gerrymandering has gone too far. So with the federal level courts removing themselves, from state level redistricting fights, it makes it even more crucial than ever to emphasize the focus on redistricting work at the state level. Many partner organizations um, such as the League of Women Voters have been working with states to push the People Power Maps campaign. And I know it was mentioned um, for, uh, Peter mentioned also that they have work on a separate campaign um, as well. 
Um, of course, with partner organizations like NAACP, ACLU, et cetera. Um, and uh, the po People Powered Maps campaign, which I've seen take place in a couple of states uh, like Alabama, Arkansas, um, have been, has been used as an effort to educate people on the importance of communities of interest. Um, and the goal is to create fair and transparent people power redistricting processes to eliminate partisan and racial gerrymandering in states nationwide. Um, as of August of 2021, 12 states, uh, and this kind of leads into the idea of prison gerrymandering and including incarcerated individuals in the process. And before I actually dive into that, because I wanted to know a few other things, um, voter education and redistricting education is vital. They go hand in hand, they coincide, it's one and the same. And we have to start there. Many people, specifically BIPOC people, don't even know that their community has been historically gerrymandered to exclude a large demographic of black and brown, brown voters. Honestly, many of them don't even know what redistricting is. I could have this conversation with a peer who is a regular voter and they still would not know what redistricting is. They do not know that their, their votes are being positioned in a way that leans the scale in favor of a majority party. So we have to start there. And, and it was mentioned um, by Kathy as well as Peter about kind of leading on the narrative, getting the narrative out there. Um, I think one thing we should consider, and, and that's definitely a great start. And one thing to consider building off of that is who is building that narrative? Um, even within partner organizations or the redistricting seat at the table, um, there still has to be diverse voices who help to guide that narrative and guide that messaging and those tools that what we do at SIX build that messaging to legislators. We also have found in the redistricting process and SIX began this process um, around, you know, uh, really thinking about this 2020 following the election cycle, because as an organization that works with state legislators to amplify their voices on progressive and equitable approaches to democracy issues, um, we have worked with state legislators and partner organizations to emphasize the redistricting process. And we realized that this year would be intensified following the 2020 election cycle for many reasons of what took place in 2020. Um, and so we began the work in January of this year, kicking off with a national redistricting webinar for legislators and partners that included um, some tidbits from Southern Coalition for Social Justice that looked at the racial and equity implications. But before I dive into um, some of the takeaways from that webinar and some of the other things that we've done um, to build the, the emphasis on messaging around communities of interest, um, we have found in this process of engaging about redistricting this year that many legislators actually do not understand the redistricting process. Many of the legislators that we're talking about in these key states um, and many of these things that we are discussing, they do not actually understand it themselves. When you go into the legislature, you don't come in with a book of knowledge of how different processes work historically. You come in ready to fight around certain issues. You come in as a former organizer, as a former educator, as a former attorney that has a strong emphasis and passion around wanting to work around these issues. So that being said, you don't necessarily come with a historical context of how redistricting works. So it's our jobs to help support the legislators on that messaging and getting around that. And also to break down that process to not just communities of interest, but to the legislators because they are their representatives. They cannot push out that messaging of fair and equitable maps if they don't understand that. And thus far um, in the past, uh, historically, a lot of, and this is for myself having conversations with legislators, um, a lot of the messaging has been fair maps. Okay, but what does that mean? Like, what does equity mean to you? We have to start defining these terms that we're using, whether it's progressive, equitable, fair. We can't just use terms and expect people to understand what that means or expect there to be transparency. So part of the transparency of the process is breaking down what things mean. And that includes breaking down how we're shaping the narrative and who's in charge of shaping said narrative. So that being said, we held a national redistricting webinar in June, understanding that we need to get ahead of the process because we knew it was gonna kick off and fall after they released the census data. And some of the key takeaways um, from that uh, was that the unique context of the 2020 census and 2021 redistricting process created a redistricting cycle unlike any before, but the federal requirements for redistricting remain constant. 
Two, transparency in their districting process is crucial to allow input for minority communities and communities of interest. Three, redistricting is usually viewed in partisan terms, but we need to name and account the larger historical perspective and recognize voters of color are frequently targets or caught in the middle of redistricting fights. Four, center for the center the redistricting process on the voices, experiences, and participation of Black and Brown communities and other people who have been historically marginalized. Five, as we launch into further into redistricting, especially in 2022, there are still ways in which everyday people can be involved in the districting process, many of which has been already named on this um, panel, and always emphasizing that it varies state by state. So there needs to be a breakdown of how that works in each state, and there are several resources for that through Campaign Legal Center, Brennan Center, um, and SIX has provided that as well. Also, um, again, you know, SIX is here available for those resources um, as well. So that's just some of the takeaways that we did from the national redistricting webinar um, that we held, and then we moved on to hosting a Teletown Hall um, with that uh, featured a QA and a uh, with North Carolina legislators and just getting their thoughts. Um, it was mentioned about putting out things in newspapers, op-eds, et cetera. Part of the ways we do that is by amplifying the legislators' voices in the media around redistricting as well and getting their take state by state. They are really, they're the journalists, so to speak, um, that can help tell the story in their state. So in order to understand redistricting fights, you kind of need people who are currently in the midst of it. And so um, we had the pleasure um, of having North Carolina State Reps Terry Brown Jr. and Brian Turner answer a few questions around that and ask them, you know, how would they like to see North Carolina expand access to voting? And also why they think redistricting is important. And some of the things that came up out of that is, um, wanting representatives in the North Carolina General, General Assembly or just in general in DC to reflect the community that they live in um, and also recognizing the gain or subtraction of congressional seats, which should be a huge change for their state. And also um, understanding and encouraging people um, to get engaged in the process and of course providing resources, which I will include in um, the chat as well. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we ended, uh, well not ended, but our next uh, access to redistricting resources um, was a project that I'm super proud of uh, with, that we partnered with our repro team, um, which Jessica, I know you've had the pleasure of working with, um, where we did a research project on redistricting and public health. Um, this was especially important to me because people think redistricting is simply around voting. But there are different aspects, and I think we've seen from COVID-19 how these different implications fare into public health. And so we put together a one-pager um, resource guide uh, that looked at those implications um, and uh, noting that in states like Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, to name a few, um, unfair redistricting practices uh, have exacerbated disparities in public health outcomes. Um, while fair and equitable redistricting has the potential to help those communities better address those inequities in public health, um, including reproductive maternal health and well being overall. And so we included resources that we put together from our partner organizations, Brennan Center, um, past work we've done with Prison Policy Initiative, um, APHA Policy Center for American Progress, um, that looked at structural racism as a public health crisis, um, redistricting and representation. Um, an overview of the redistricting landscape, how partisan gerrymandering limits access to healthcare. Um, of course, including our um, recent report that launched in March uh, of No Democracy Without Black Women, and also looking at how underrepresentation, which is still a huge issue at 4.8%, underrepresentation of Black women legislators also leads to an inequitable process. Um, and that's for any BIPOC legislators. Um, it's not going to be easy to have fair representation when you, um, in communities when you don't even have fair representation in the legislature. So that's just a starter. Um, and then also um, looking at how COVID-19 um, pandemic delayed the census process and also delayed the redistricting cycle, we have to understand the implications of that as well and how that impacts map drawing. So I will include those resources 
in the chat. I don't want to take up too much more time. Um, but again, all of these things are, are key takeaways for looking at the redistricting landscape overall. And hopefully we can continue to be proactive and elevate the voices necessary to make it less marginalized or not marginalized at all. Thank you, Lauren, for all those important points. And I really appreciate you bringing up the importance of having the communities most impacted be at the table in creating solutions to these problems and also how redistricting is something that has historically targeted voters of color. Um, something else you mentioned that I really um, think is important is how so many legislators enter into their elected official position that without knowing everything there is to know about redistricting or fair maps, or what does that all mean? So I just wanna put in that personal plug for folks who are listening you are qualified to run for office. Everybody is qualified to run for office. You do not have to be an expert in everything. And, and almost nobody who is an elective official starts out as an expert. And in fact, a lot of them don't know that much. And you probably know more about your own community than a lot of your own elected officials as a member of your own community. So I just think it's important um, to keep encouraging folks and letting folks know, you know, Legislators work for us and we all have the right to be an active part of our own government. Um, so Lauren, you mentioned some of your work with Prison Policy Initiative, which is a perfect segue. Um, since the first US Census in 1790, the federal government has included incarcerated people in the population counts where they are imprisoned. This is a technical detail of a little known policy and can have outsized impacts on prison towns across the US for the next decade. The Prison Policy Initiative is working to do something about it. So we're gonna hear from Alex Kaistura from Prison Policy Initiative. Alex, can you tell us a little bit about prison gerrymandering, uh, what that is and the impact and how states are working to end this practice? Yeah, thanks for having me here today. And um, prison gerrymandering in the context of redistricting is an important issue to tackle because it's something that works in conjunction with all the other kinds of gerrymandering that have been talked about. It really gets to the core of redistricting, which is the, the underlying data that you're using. So um, as Jessica mentioned, since 1790, the Census Bureau has counted incarcerated folks at the location of the facility where they're at on census day rather than their home address. So while everybody else is counted where they live and sleep most of the time, somebody who's incarcerated is counted at the location of the facility, no matter how long or short that they're staying there for. And when that data is used to draw district lines, it ends up kind of padding out districts that contain correctional facilities. And you end up with uh, districts that uh, incarcerated folks disproportionately come from, but also every single other district without a correctional facility ends up um, with less representation than they warrant by their population. And so the way this started um, is kind of good to know if you're going to end it. So in 1790, um, the process, you know, there wasn't redistricting back then. Um, so this was just something that was done out of convenience by the Census Bureau. And it progressed onward. Um, and, it, you know, incarceration wasn't as big part of the American infrastructure as it is now. So, it, you know, in 1790, it worked just as well as, seven, uh, as 1970. Going forward from there, we had a rise in mass incarceration in this country. And in so doing, you've really infected the redistricting data through the Census Bureau practice, where even if you try to draw equal districts, because the Census Bureau counted so many people in the wrong place, you're going to end up with a skewed effect, mostly trending away from um, our urban areas and giving that power to remote rural areas where the prisons are sited. And this um, has a pretty big impact. Um, you know, John and I were at a hearing in Rhode Island last night where they're, unless they do something, um, they're gonna draw a district where 20% of the people in the district are just incarcerated in the 
correctional facilities there. Uh, what they've done historically is um, they've tried to kind of wiggle the redistricting, the district lines in between um, the number of facilities they have there to kind of spread out the impact among different districts. And that's worked to a degree, like they haven't prison gerrymandered as much as they could have, I guess, but um, that's kind of the least of the stopgap measures that states can take. Um, a lot of states are now trending toward just fixing the census basically um, for redistricting purposes. They take the census data that the Bureau gives them. They take home address data from the Department of Corrections and um, they map out all that data, correct the census data for redistricting. And about 12 states are doing this. Um, they'll be drawing their district lines based on counting everybody at home. Uh, then you have kind of uh, states uh, like Massachusetts, where um, similar to Rhode Island, but they're a lot better at it, is they're looking at the data that the, the Census Bureau um, actually now publishes, uh, the, what they call the group quarters populations, which is the population they counted in the facilities, so that a state is no longer blind when redistricting, they actually know where the faults lie in the census data. So what Massachusetts is doing is um, well, actually, they just finished. They drew their lines um, while keeping an eye on that separate table that the Census Bureau gives them so that they don't accidentally fall into prison gerrymandering issues. And, you know, even um, as I mentioned before, it's, it's something that works in conjunction with other gerrymandering. So even if you're pushing things to the constitutional limits in terms of let's say your population deviations, because we strive for equality, but you're allowed constitutionally to be a little bit unequal in your districts. Um, but there, you know, there's an end to how unequal those districts can be. But if you draw a district right against that line and then put um, a lot of correctional populations in it at the location of the facility, then all of a sudden, if you're looking at the real members of those communities that live in that district, all of a sudden that district is way outside constitutional bounds. So this is something that can be used in conjunction with other kind of forms of gerrymandering, which we've seen uh, that districts that um, get padded out with prison populations are oftentimes already uh, very low on people. Like they barely meet their constitutional requirements for population. Um, so prison gerrymandering has this kind of impact on everybody. It has the, um, the folks that gain the most in terms of representative power are in the districts that contain the largest prisons. But, you know, let's say even if you're in the district with the second largest prison population, you're still negatively impacted by prison gerrymandering. And there's not a single district that doesn't lose representation. Um, and so what, what the states have been doing uh, so far is um, they've been doing this adjustment, like I talked about, um, the folks at the local level have talked about local redistricting as well. They were actually the pioneers of fixing prison gerrymandering. There have been over 200 uh, counties and uh, cities and local jurisdictions that have corrected this because, you know, if you're drawing, um, if you're a small county, out in the middle of nowhere, you don't have much population, you're drawing districts that are about, you know, 1,000, 2,000 people each. If you have a large state prison there, all of a sudden that makes up pretty much a significant portion of a single district. A lot of these places would be forced to draw a district that would be perpetually vac vacant because there are no actual residents to fill the seat to run for office. Um, and so when uh, the local government started saying this, they, you know, they started taking action because it just became so obvious. And um, from there, uh, it went to, to state action as well. I Yeah, it's so interesting. I noticed, cause I get a little obsessed with like tracking COVID numbers. And I've noticed there's this little, um, there's this little area of our state where the COVID numbers are really low, but surrounded by really high numbers. And it's because of prison being there because I think their vaccines 
are mandated. I'm not sure about the rules there, but it's very interesting. Um, in many cases, rural, predominantly white towns are seeing their population numbers boosted by population counts from prisons disproportionately made up of black and brown people. Can you talk about how prison gerrymandering is linked to mass incarceration and the over-policing of communities of color? Yeah, so while this impacts everybody to some degree, some communities are definitely more impacted than others. And the direct link between prison gerrymandering and uh, criminal justice reform specifically can be seen kind of clearly in a couple of examples. In uh, New York State, before they ended prison gerrymandering after the 2010 census, um, the Rockefeller drug laws were in place far longer than public opinion supported them. And that was because there was a slew of um, legislators from upstate New York whose districts were heavily padded out by the prisons up there. And any time reform would go through their committee, they would just uh, shut it down right away because they really looked at the prisons as kind of free constituents that they weren't answerable to. Um, they just you know, had them on the books for the district size and that was it. Uh, and so they looked at the prisons as a way to make ensure that they stayed in power. Um, and in um, Rhode Island, oh, we had a similar situation with the former Speaker of the House, Mattiello, where there were criminal justice reform packages that had broad support in the state. Um, but uh, as Speaker of the House, he was in one of those prison gerrymandered districts. Um, he would just never let them go up to a vote. So there's a very clear direct line um, for legislation in those cases, but it's also just an insidious systemic shift in priorities where um, if the communities aren't represented correctly, the priorities of the legislature shift. And this is something where we talked about resources today, that it's not just about political power, but it's also where your resources go. And while there are no funding formulas that are kind of tricked by this um, census work, and no funding formulas would change with a change in the redistricting data because no funding formulas use redistricting data, of course. Um, this would create a shift in priorities. Once you have equal representation based on where people actually live, based on communities, um, that starts to shift the priorities of the legislature to reflect the needs of the communities. And um, so you have things like uh, police reform, criminal justice reforms, um, you know, school funding, all sorts of things start to shift. Thank you for that. Um, as long as the Census Bureau continues to count incarcerated people in the wrong place, any state-based solution is a helpful stopgap measure, but we are grateful for the state's efforts to right this wrong. Uh, we also wanted to mention there are also efforts to ensure that not only maps are fair, but that communities are truly represented. The LGBTQ Victory Fund is urging political map drawers to create districts that help large gay populations gain representation. They are launching a first of its kind effort to lobby redistricting authorities in different states to consider gay populations as communities of interest in map drawing. There's also opportunity districts which have contributed to explosive growth of BIPOC in elected office. Uh, we Belong Together is about making sure LGBTQ communities are not ignored or denied political power in places where there are large numbers and a collective voice, that which would intentionally and authentically represent the district. Um, we have about a little under 15 minutes left, so I wanted to see if there are any questions um, so far and um, coming from our Facebook page. I'm just going to give a moment for our lovely Facebook moderator to send me any questions if there are any. Well, I will be standing by. Oh, I see she's sending me something. Um, okay. So I will be um, just give y'all a quick opportunity now, since we're getting close to time, to give a 
chance to say one short closing remark. If you have anything that you want to remind folks of or anything coming up from your organization or one action, what's one thing you would like um, people to do or take away from this call? I'm just going to do a round robin and everybody gets a chance to um, speak for a minute about that. So I guess we can go in order of the speakers. Ali, you were the first, so you want to have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, so here at Represent Us, we have a few different anti-gerrymandering campaigns up and running. So we have one in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Wisconsin primarily, but we're also doing a big national push to pass the FTVA, or Freedom to Vote Act, which would ban gerrymandering nationwide and expand voting rights for millions of people across the country. So even if you're not in one of those three states I mentioned, your state is still dealing with redistricting and you have a role in the process. We have an exceptional organizing team over here and we would love for you to get involved. So all you have to do is go to represent.us slash volunteer, uh, fill out your information and we will reach out to you. Kathy, do you have any closing remarks? Yes, um, really just two. First off, I really just want to lift up what John and Peter um, had mentioned, which is that even if the congressional and state legislative redistricting is done in your state, all the local redistricting isn't, and it's going to continue in most um, states through the course of 2022. So there's plenty of time um, to get engaged um, in some of that uh, redistricting. And um, as was mentioned, it's sort of you can actually have a little bit more of an outsized influence on what's happening on the local level. And there's no question, particularly in um, the South and in some of the uh, harder, uh, politically harder states for us to move agendas that what is happening at the local level is going to make a huge difference. You can find out what's happening in some of the states by going to redistrictinghub.com. Um, and, uh, and they'll have um, who's doing some of the redistricting in various states um, and figure out how to, you know, both materials in terms of how to testify um, or what you might raise, but also how to um, engage and, um, and who you might reach out to in your state. Thanks. Peter, any closing remarks from you? Yeah, um, I'm guessing that, you know, for those who are watching this, they already know how important redistricting is. But in that vein of trying to get out and, and message this and shape the narrative uh, and talk to other people and get them involved, you know, one of the things I always try to talk to folks about is that uh, it doesn't matter what you're interested in. It's a redistricting issue. So if you care about criminal justice reform, that's a redistricting issue. Education, redistricting, healthcare, redistricting. It's all redistricting because your legislators, for the most part, are really just reflecting and representing their districts. You know, if you see a, a legislator, or a, a local official, and you're like, how could they act like that? Or how could they vote like that? Go visit their district. They're usually pretty representative of the people who voted for them. Um, and so everything we want to work on comes back to redistricting. And so I think in a way, if you're if you're kind of taking this conversation, you're going to go out to your friends, your family, Thanksgiving dinner, whatever it may be, and you're trying to get other people involved and interested, just let them know that anything they care about, it all comes back to redistricting. Um, and then the final thing is, for those of you who are watching this who are in Louisiana, we are really at Louisiana Progress trying to partner with people on the ground who want to work on local uh, redistricting campaigns. And so I'm putting my email there in the chat. I'm also going to put the link to our redistricting page where you can find um, we have a three part guide. For, fourth part is going to be coming out soon. Part one is a redistricting 101 like you would see, I think, from just about any organization on here. Um, part two is a glossary. Part three looks at specifically Louisiana redistricting. Uh, part four, which we'll have up shortly, will we'll deal with how to advocate on redistricting. And then we also have some presentations. Uh, we already have a couple parishes for those of you outside of Louisiana counties, uh, presentations on some parishes and, and sort of dealing directly with competitiveness and racial proportionality in those parishes, we're gonna keep adding more. Um, but if you live in Louisiana uh, and you know are interested in doing some local redistricting advocacy, please reach out to us. We want to help you. We wanna support you. We wanna give you the analysis, expertise, communications, all the kind of stuff that you need to, to get that done. And I suppose if you're in another state and you're just interested, you can also reach out to us, uh, but yeah, mainly looking at Louisiana. Thank you. Thank you, John. Do you have anything you want to add? 
Sure, and thank you again um, for hosting this. This was great, um, and what a collection of, of people to bring together. Um, I, I want to make one more point, which is that you know I kind of talked about the long tail, right? And it, it's it's congressional and state legislative, and then um, local redistricting. But then you know if you think about it, then comes another wave of reform because right now we're at peak redistricting, right? People are paying attention to redistricting now more than they will for another 10 years. Uh, and so now is the time to be having the conversations about, listen, you might not be satisfied with the outcome um, of what's happening in your state or community right now, but we need to spend the next 10 years fixing it uh, so that uh, we don't repeat this uh, cycle. It's hard to get people motivated about a reform that doesn't take effect until 2030. Um, and I think uh, Alex and I might have seen last night that with prison gerrymandering in our state, the reform might not happen for yet another decade. Um, but but now's the time people are excited about this uh, and they're uh, informed about this. So now is the time to get them involved. There are endless numbers of organizations, um, many represented here, but um, many that aren't that you heard about, League of Women Voters, um, the Brennan Center. I mean, represent us is here, Common Cause, working on the ground. I mean, innumerable organizations we didn't didn't mention. Get involved with a local organization. Uh, as I said, redistrictingcommunitycollege.com is our hub, along with a lot of those allies for, for educating people. Um, and it also has this fun feature, which is um, we put out a weekly newsletter called the Gerrymander Gazette. Uh, it's an email newsletter. So if you're really jonesing for like, your weekly update um, and you're into newsletters, which a lot of people are, uh, is a way to get um, sort of all your news in one email. Uh, sign up to get the Gerrymander Gazette. I'm sure uh, Dan Vicuna, who puts that together, will be, will be grateful. But thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, go ahead if you have anything you want to add. Yes, I think John um, gave a great segue to um, some last takeaways that I was going to include, um, which is really building that long term investment, as um, he noted, um, and thinking about the next 10 years, maybe even 20 years ahead. Um, one, because the redistricting process lays out what the next uh, decade of your political landscape looks like. Two, we're also in um, the uh, transparency and accountability era. So this is the time to really take advantage of that. Um, 2020 was that wake up call. Um, it was that alarm um, to get us up, but uh, it wasn't uh, the end of that fight. And so we kind of need to think about that as it um, relates to not only midterm elections, presidential elections, but also local elections as well. For the organizations or anyone on the call um, that works with uh, organizers, people on the ground. Um, there have been several organizations mentioned um, to connect with, to collaborate with, um, and then making sure that um, we're placing uh, diverse voices at the forefront and really building uh, a foundation of grounding um, race and equity into the redistricting process. Um, also for those that work with legislators like six um, that are on the call today, um, I included a lot of resources in the chat and also my email address, but um, for partner organizations, we are um, always looking for ways to provide our legislators with more re um, resources. So please feel free um, to reach out if you would like to collaborate, um, whether it's around a messaging training um, or providing more tools um, at the forefront of a briefing for legislators as well. Um, so again, all of those things are in the chat, my information, and thank you for um, providing this platform to have this dialogue today. Thank you. I know we have one more person, Alex. Um, Alex, do you have anything to add? I mean, I think I'm going to double up on what a lot of folks have said, which is get involved. Uh, if your state is still redistricting, um, go to those redistricting hearings. Um, argue against prison gerrymandering. There's data that the Census Bureau is putting out to help the states avoid it. Uh, the Census Bureau's actively providing help to the states to deal with their own problem. And uh, if your state is done, move on to the local stuff. Um, go to your counties, parishes, uh, 
school board cities. And, you know, even if all you care about is the school board, a lot of places use the same map as the county or the same map as the city. So make sure uh, to go to all the meetings uh, or at least know how they all interact. Um, just ask somebody uh, and, you know, these tend to be smaller meetings. Uh, so your voice will have a big impact. Thank you. And I just wanted to mention, I know folks were um, putting things in the chat, their contact info. So since this is going stream to Facebook Live, it's not actually, I don't think the audience can actually see the chat, but I will share those resources um, and comments on our video to make sure those are there. Oh, and it's also been shared on the Women Project's Twitter and under hashtag RJ Combos. Um, before we close, I just wanted to give a plug to some of the work LCRF members are doing. Um, there is a very scary Supreme Court case coming up. Um, we're gonna be hearing on December 1st that directly challenges Roe v. Wade. Um, we're going to be hearing from Lyft Louisiana and Center for Reproductive Rights this Thursday. Um, they are going to be providing a litigation briefing call about the litigation landscape and how it would impact Louisiana and what this will mean for reproductive rights in our communities. We also hope we'll hear from y'all, hope you'll be speaking out on December 1st as a part of Supreme Court arguments on the Mississippi 15 week ban and commit to doing all you can to get bans off our bodies, ensure we can all get to live with health and dignity and control of our own futures. We are also looking forward to co-hosting a series of discussions around mutual aid an opportunity to give back over the next month. So I know that will be a really great conversation. There's more to come. We know this work is tiring and frustrating and it's sad at times with when our communities are under attack, but we are in it together and together we are strong and we will make a positive impact. Thank you so much to our panelists for being so generous with their time and for sharing all of your wisdom and telling us about the work you're doing on the ground. We appreciate you. Um, and we hope that you will follow all their organizations on social, digital, so that you can continue to hear from them and support our work to push for reproductive health rights and justice. Thank you, everyone.